welcome especially to those who have joined us this morning. Just one or two practical things while the technician is sitting up here. <laughs> <laughs> I just remind you, uh, Sandra will be in to open the bookshop from 2 to 3 in the afternoon. Then for confessions, or those who'd like to see one of us individually, there'll be two or three of us available this evening after from about 7.30 to 8.30 in the two rooms there and probably somebody in here as well. So 7.30 to 8.30 this evening. Okay, we okay to? Let me just begin with a prayer as we begin our day. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, we give you thanks for this new day. For this gift you give us, may our day be filled with light, the light that you give, the light from your flame burning within us. Help us this day to be silent, to listen, and to open our hearts to your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we're looking at John of the Cross's work, his living flame. And last night they gave a lot of an overall introduction and a background to this work how it came about and where it fits in John's teaching, his thinking. And a little about how we might approach it. What I want to do this morning is to look at some of the main themes that are running through this work. And I've given here on this page a list, not my list, I have borrowed this or borrowed it from Federico Ruiz, who's publishing this book here. There's a little summary that he gives that I've just sort of plucked out and, because it's put far better than I could ever put it since Federico was my professors in Rome many years ago. But first of all, a sense to recap a little bit from last night, how we need to approach this work, the flame. As I said, it's a work of art. And like any work of art, it is about showing us something. rather than explaining to us. We're shown something. And we draw from what we're shown. And we can come back to a great work of art over and over again. And it will speak to us in a way that is new. <coughs> and how it will speak to us will be so much dependent and where I am at this state now. And the eye and the mind that is taking in what's being shown. And I mentioned last night that it's important, and John demonstrates this for us in his prologue, that just as he in order to write this, needed to be in a state of recollection, so also the reader does. We got to approach this in prayer, with a spirit of prayer, of openness. Because 
It's a work of art. But it's not a work of art that we can just casually observe. It's like a great work of music that draws us in. That draws us into an experience. When we allow a great work of music to draw us in, we become part of the experience. It's not something that's happening out there anymore, but something that we're part of. And that's what this work is. We, we, we need to become part of us. Because what this work is, is a celebration of what God does. And it's particularly a celebration of the fulfillment of those words in John's Gospel. I already mentioned them last night, but let's remind ourselves of them again. That the Father, Son, and Spirit will come and dwell in the person who loves them. And it's a celebration of the fulfillment of those words. The Trinity now lives within the person. And so, as John said in his introduction to this poem and this commentary, is that it, they are the stanzas that speak of that, from that place where God and the soul, or we could say the Trinity and the deepest center of the person, which we look at later this morning, that deepest center, that place of profound truth within each one of us. Where that place of profound truth meets with God. And meets with God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. <laughs> and the dynamics, the force, the power of that meeting is love. So this work is a celebration of that. And I want to have a look at this morning at these themes that I just put on the page I've given you. And like everything with John, particularly with the living flame, every word we use is inadequate. And I'm rather uncomfortable about using the word themes here. Because that's not really what they are. They're more like profound truths that are interwoven into this work. Like a fabric that threads are interwoven into it. There are various threads interwoven into this. Because John is not explaining any of these here. And that's not the intention. The intention is to draw our attention to the truth of these. Draw our attention to the reality of them. And most importantly, to draw our attention to the power of them and what that, that is doing in us. What that changes for us both in how we see ourselves, how we see all that is around us, how we relate, and who and how God is for us. So, for the want of a better word, I'll call them the main themes of this. So, to just brief <coughs> run through them, The mystery of the Blessed Trinity, dwelling within, communicating itself, transforming, and giving delight to the soul. Mm -hmm. 
we need to be careful, I think, how we understand the word soul. I think nowadays we see it in perhaps a, a less rich way than it would have been seen when John was writing this for nearly 450 years ago. Maybe from our way of understanding things, it might be better to see it as the person or the true person Because it, we tend to see the soul as somehow one dimension or one aspect of a person, and it's not. His intention is not that. It is the whole person. But the whole person living from that deepest place within. So maybe something like the true person, or the person living the fullness of the truth of who he or she is. So anyway, that's just uh, just to be alert to that, that don't reduce or impoverish the meaning of that word. And sometimes we do. And even sometimes people who write about John the Cross do that. So let's just be careful with this. <coughs> so... This is the Trinity, living within. Now that's not just something spatial. That's where the person is. Living, dwelling, dwelling is living, is, is a word that's filled with meaning in the context of the flame. It's because it kind of, oh, it's drawing life from. Become, being, expressing who one is there. So it is the, the life of the Trinity. Everything, as I mentioned, I tried to get this across a little bit last night, that everything in this work is dynamic. There's no, nothing static here. Everything is dynamic. Fire is the, everything is on fire here. So this is the Trinity living within the person. Fullness of life of God within the person. Communicating itself. Father, Son and Spirit communicating itself. And that's where this <clears throat> work is taking us to, to that communication. So it's not just the Trinity there, living there. The Trinity is communicating to the person, to the soul. It's constantly communicating. And what it is communicating is the life of the Trinity. Communicating its own life. It's transforming. Transforming the person at every dimension of the person. This is, this is that, that, again, the image of fire is so, brings this out for us. So if something is, it has a fire, fire pulls everything in. Fire transforms everything. You can't be in a fire and not be burdened by it. So the fire is, is transforming everything here. And it's giving delight. Celebrate. This is a whole, every here is a celebration. Even when, you know, and this work takes us to all sorts of places. Sometimes the very painful places, wherever the need of trans, it's, it's this, this same flame that does all the transforming, the purifying, the healing. But it's a celebration of that. 
that's always being celebrated. If, and this work does at times take us to very painful places. It's a celebration of it. It's being celebrated. Because whatever is the work of God, whatever is the work of God, of the Trinity, must be celebrated. That's the human, the right human, whatever God is doing, celebrate. Even when it is painful and challenging and disturbing and bewildering, celebrate it. It's a celebration. So this is work is the Trinity and the soul celebrate. It's, it's the mystery of the Trinity. Important word. Is, this work is prou profoundly mysterious. And the more we know God, the more mysterious God becomes. So it is the mystery of the Trinity. That's why we ob observe us, allow ourselves to be drawn into it and experience it. As I said last night, the, the important words here are taste, touch, feel, experience, rather than understand or see or hear. There are words up here which limit us. We can taste, feel, and experience what we do not need to understand or cannot understand, or we can let go of the understanding of us. So this is a profound encounter with the mystery of the Trinity. Because that's what Jesus in the Gospel said will happen to anyone who enters into this relationship of love with him. This is what happens. The second strand we have running through this thread, the foundation of human interiority, revealed and empowered by the presence of God. <coughs> now, we are in the depths of the human person. The reality of what it means to be human. The presence of God tells us who we are. And takes us right to those very foundations of who we are. the very depths and truth of who we are. Just as God, Trinity, becomes more and more mysterious and bigger and bigger and bigger here, so also does the human person. There are depths. And this work takes us into the, the deepest center of the person. And John tells us that's where, where we meet God. It's the presence of God in the deepest center of the person. That's what reveals to us what it means to be human, who we are as human beings. But it doesn't just reveal it. It's not just revealed, it empowers us. But it's an empowering that's a paradoxical empowering. We have to be careful how we understand this. It's the power that comes from God's presence, not human power. It's a letting go of the human power. Or a purification of anything we might consider to be power at a human level. That the true power that comes from God... <coughs> 
So it brings out dimensions of the human person that otherwise remain hidden, impoverished, never grow or mature. We see this at a human level. We, there are many dimensions to physically, psychologically, emotionally, socially. And if any particular dimension doesn't grow, the whole person is impoverished. <coughs> but the most fundamental dimension of the human person that needs to grow is the spirit. And here we're coming, we're touching the heights of spiritual maturity. And when we touch those heights of spiritual maturity, we see a fullness of human maturity. Dimensions of what it is to be human that are otherwise not seen. And they grow from the deepest center within the person. And it is the presence of God there <clears throat> that reveals and empowers this, makes this happen. The third trait here, the attitude of adoration and praise on the part of the human person. That's, that's, stand back here. Adoration and praise of what's happening. I mentioned last night the word glory, such an important word in this work, because that's the word that sort of indicates the presence of God. We're in the atmosphere or the environment of God here. We're breathing the air of God. So the right attitude for us as people is adoration and praise. And that is, is, is linked with the next one, the silence of prayer, which first and foremost is love. The silence of prayer. That's, that, that's put beautifully. Because it is not prayer in silence. It's a silence that is very profound. It's not an external silence. I mentioned last night, you know, John de Cross wrote this work in 14 days when he was very, very busy and occupied with a whole lot of other things. So he didn't have much, if any, external silence when he was writing this. But rather, it's another kind of silence. It's a silence of one's thoughts, one's ideas, any kind of input on the part of the person. A silence of everything that is not of God. Now is the time just to step. Because the first and foremost is love. Prayer here is love. <coughs> But the way that the person loves in the flame is receiving. It is all receiving. So prayer here is receiving. Prayer here is all, all in God. So the silence of prayer. There's no longer anything of what I want or things should be, but God. It's praying in the love and in the words of God.
Next one. Active passivity in receiving and collaborating with the Holy Spirit. The very beginning of this work, John tells us that the Holy Spirit is the flame. And that, of course, is imagery. The Acts of the Apostles, the fire, the Spirit came as fire. Spirit is the flame. But also the flame is the Trinity. God, you cannot have one without the other. But this is a work of the Holy Spirit. And I think those two words, active passivity, probably go as close as one can to expressing what needs to be expressed here. Because it is receiving the work of the Spirit. The Spirit is doing everything here. But it is not passivity. The person isn't just sitting there and the Holy Spirit is sort of dropping down on top of the person. It's not that. That's why the image of fire is so good here. Fire is active. Spirit lights the fire, sets the fire, inflames the fire, but the fire goes out, out to others, sets other things on fire. Sparks fly from it. Other fires come. So it's an active receiving. An active receiving and an active collaborating. As collaborating at a very profound level, the spirit doesn't force himself on anybody. This collaborating is a lifetime, takes a lifetime of learning. The person here is so totally open to what the spirit is doing. Receiving and collaborating with the Holy Spirit at every, every dimension of the person. And the final one of these themes we've got here. The ever-renewed demand of the cross as a preparation for Christian love and its realization. Again, that is very well put. The cross is everywhere here in the flame. There is nowhere a person can be in the spiritual life where the cross is absent. And here in this sentence we've got a few pointers for us here. <clears throat> Ever renewed demand of the cross. So it's going to be something new that's asked here. The cross is always asking something new. Leading us to somewhere new. It will manifest itself in new ways. And the cross is two things here. It's the preparation for Christian love. We know that from the Gospels and the New Testament. There's no Christianity, there's no Christian love before the death and resurrection of Jesus. Christianity is post-resurrection. Christianity is post-cross. The cross is the preparation. 
is the journey into Christianity, into Christian love. The cross shows us what Christian love is. It brings us to that point where Christian love can begin. So here in the person, in the soul, their encounter with the cross in whatever form that takes in the person's life, that's what enables the person to love in a Christian way. That is what brings the person to the point of Christian love, which is what the person is living, doing here and living here. But there's, there's a further step than that. There's a further stage to that. The cross is also the realization of Christian love. All of Christian love is in some way the cross. Part of the cross, it's a living something, some dimension of the cross. To love in a Christian way requires something of the self-giving, of the generosity, of the radical love that the cross is. So here in this living flame, the cross is ever present and is revealing the full truth or dimension of Christian love, or maybe I should put that better, making possible <clears throat> Christian love and in what it really is. Because without the cross, it just would not be possible. <coughs> so these are strands threads, themes that are interwoven in this work. They're not explained. Rather, our attention is drawn to them. Not just our, our hearts are drawn to them, it's better. Or we're drawn into the truth of them. Or the truth of them is in some way reveals to us. This list, as I said, is very good. I couldn't come up with anything better than this. But it's a list, so many other things one could add to this list. We could never stop creating a list like this. There is just so much depth there. But at least I think it gives us some idea, somewhere to begin from. What I want to do in the remaining sessions is to simply dip in and look at certain aspects of this flame. As I said last night, the four stanzas, each of them in different ways is showing us a variety of dimensions of this flame. And so in the other session, I'm just going to pick out some of these. And we just have a look at some of them. But it will be a bit at random because it's just impossible to look at everything. And, but with the intention, the intention I would have in mind is in some way just giving some pointers or indicators that you can read this, listen to it, appreciate it, experience it yourselves, prayerfully and hopefully in a way that's rich and enlightening. So we come back to it as a memory.